All right. You have your Bible? If you do, I would invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. I'd like to share some thoughts with you on this uh, first night of Passover. The message that I have titled Passover Hope. So Exodus chapter 6. I want to read just a few verses here. I'm going to begin in the sixth verse of Exodus chapter 6. It says, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. One more verse, verse 8. And I will bring you in unto the land, concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Those six and seven verses of Exodus 6 are the place that the Jewish people to this very day get the four cups that uh, are a major part of the Passover Seder. The Exodus is the historical background for all of the covenants that God made with the nation of Israel. God promised Israel that what he planned to do for them in those uh, four I wills that you see in that uh, sixth and seventh verse that represent those four cups of uh, the Passover Seder, the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Sanctification separates you. Also the second cup called the cup of deliverance. I will rid, uh, uh, rid you out of bondage. The third cup, the cup of redemption. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. And the fourth cup, the cup of praise in verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. I want to add to those four cup verses, verses 6 and 7, the eighth verse as well. Because there's an additional I will that often gets overlooked. And I don't think it should be. Verse 8, And I will bring you in unto the land. And I'm going to give you that land as an inheritance, as a, as a heritage. I think that's rather important, especially in light of uh, modern times, wouldn't you? What I want to say is that what God said he would do as a result of the exodus, as a result of what is called Passover, filled that nation with hope. It had to. It filled them with hope, hope for their future. They would be redeemed. Uh, uh, th that is, that God would, would pay the price for their freedom, for their liberation. He would liberate them. He would give them land. He would give them a future that eventually would be a 1,000-year kingdom, which hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. And uh, because God chose Israel to be a light to the nations, I want to say this, that Passover then not only brings hope to Israel, but it brings hope to all the nations of this earth. And I think the reason that the Exodus is the most mentioned event in the Bible is not only because it is a significant uh, ancient historical event, but also because it points forward to a specific hope for Israel, for the world, not only in this present world, but in eternity. That's how important Passover is. And there are three particular areas of hope that I want to draw out of this tonight. Don't you feel that you need hope? We always need hope. But in times like this, 
We feel like we need an extra measure of hope. Well, I want to give you three particular areas of hope that emerge for not only Israel, but for us from what the Passover accomplished. Before we do so, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look to you. We thank you for your wonderful, wonderful exodus and the deliverance and the liberation and the everything that feeds into that. And Lord, make the hope of this ancient, ancient Passover event to fill our hearts with hope now for a future with anticipation, expectation that glorifies you. It's amazing. You have an amazing redemption plan. And to think that any human being can be a part of it is just outstanding. And it's overwhelming. Tonight, minister to our hearts through your word for the glory of Jesus in whose name we ask it. The Messiah. Amen. I want to turn your attention back to verse 6 again in Exodus 6. And I want to talk, first of all, about the promise that he says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will, I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. To me, all of that could be summarized in one word, and that word is deliverance. And the word deliverance is the first hope that emerges from the thoughts of the Passover. They were being liberated, they were being delivered and thus liberated from actual, literal, physical slavery. But did you know, have you thought, has it occurred to you, as Jesus said in John chapter 8, that whosoever committeth sin is a slave of sin. And he then goes on to say, but I'm giving you the truth. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so one of the first hopes that emerges from the celebration of Passover for not only the Jew, but for the whole world, is this hope of deliverance. That is, the liberation, the freedom from the slavery of sin. A greater slavery for sure. In fact, any person who comes to God through his redemption plan, which involves the reception of the sacrifice that Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, has accomplished on your behalf, if you come through him, you are delivered. You are rescued from the penalty that is attached to your life as a sinner. And that is done on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible says that he is the Messiah that is sacrificed, the Passover sacrifice for us. John, the baptizer, sees Jesus coming and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, we are also said uh, and told in the Scripture that the wages or the payment for sin is death. The wages or the payment for sin is death. And that is spiritual death. That is being cut off and, and separated forever from God. And that is the second death. That is a death in a burning lake of fire that sometimes is referred to as hell. We are delivered from that. We can be delivered. We can be rescued from that penalty of death. We can be rescued from a guilty conscience. We can be rescued from the penalty, which also would involve that ever-present fear of judgment one day. The Bible says that the perfect love relationship that we can have with God will deliver us from that fear that torments, that fear of future judgment. And so there's deliverance. There's a rescue from the penalty 
of sin, but there's also deliverance from sin's power. Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. And so he says on that basis, purge out the old leaven. In other words, cleanse your life based upon the sacrifice of the Passover lamb that has already been sacrificed for us. And the, the, the idea is that there is, there is cleansing and there is victory over sin in any human being's life who comes through Jesus the Messiah. We are told that when we come to him, he gives to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We are told that when we come through Jesus, that we are given uh, the right to be a partaker of the nature of God himself so that we can escape the corruption of the sin in this world. We are told in the scripture that when we come through the sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah, that his very spirit comes to live in us. And the Holy Spirit, simultaneous to coming to live in us permanently, joins us to the Lord Jesus and uh, as a result, he, if you depend upon him, then he will, uh, in your moment of need, he will infuse into your life the power of the victorious life of Christ. And uh, it will then counteract the power of sin in your life. So the first hope is deliverance. Deliverance from both sin's penalty being rescued from the penalty of sin, and being delivered from the power of sin. What good is it to be forgiven sin and then not be able to avoid it, not be able to have victory over it? We have deliverance from the slavery of sin. Whosoever committed sin, Jesus said, is a servant. But I give you the truth, and the truth will make you, you know the truth of the deliverance. The second hope that comes from this passage. Look at verse 7 of Exodus 6. And I will take you for a people, and I will be to you a God. Now, that happened at Mount Sinai. That's where it all began. But Mount Sinai, where God gave the law to Moses for the people of Israel, was not just a governmental uh, contract or covenant. It was not just a treaty that he was making with them that then would function as Israel's constitution, if I could put it that way. But in the Jewish mind, what was happening at Mount Sinai was that God was performing a wedding. God was performing a ceremony. See that phraseology in verse 7? I will take you to me. That phrase, take you to me, is a Jewish way of saying, marry me. I will marry you. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 2, Jesus, or, or the, the prophet talks about Israel who has strayed from him and said, remember when you and I were engaged Remember the, the, the fresh young love of a spousal? Remember how I courted you, as it were, in the desert, in the wilderness? Remember how he parted the Red Sea? Remember how he provided water from the rock for his, for his people and how he gave them manna, bread from heaven? The prophet reminds them of the day of their courtship there in the wilderness. Isaiah 54 and verse 5, Israel is said to be the wife of the Lord. The Lord says, I am thy husband to Israel. Couldn't be any clearer than Hosea. When you get to the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, I think in verses 19 and 20 in particular, he says, I will betroth thee. He's talking about bringing her back. Uh, her restoration, Israel, as a, as a nation to him. I will betroth thee, and uh, you will be my wife. And so what happens on Mount Sinai, I believe, is, the, is uh, pictured a Jewish wedding taking place. 
God's performing a ceremony. Well, in any Jewish wedding, you have a you, you have the, the hoopah, right? And uh, it's just a, a canopy with four poles. Well, what was the hoopah on Mount Sinai? Could it have been that that smoke that covered the top of the mountain as God was meeting there with Moses, the representative? And of course, every Jewish wedding, before the wedding, the couple has to go to the mikvah. They have to go through the ritual cleansing. If you read the, the, uh, the story at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, Moses was told by God, go down to the people and tell them to sanctify themselves and wash their clothes, cleanse themselves, go through the mikvah, if you will, a ritual purification. And then, of course, in Jewish weddings, there's not vows uh, exchanged like there is in our typical weddings. Instead, they have a written document called a ketubah. It's a wedding contract. And uh, it's, it's written down, and uh, it's, uh, there's a, a significant signing ceremony that goes along with a, a Jewish wedding. Well, what's the ketubah? When God wedded Israel to himself, he gave two documents called the Ten Commandments. And uh, they were written by the finger of God. And those were the wedding vows that God uh, wrote down that we call the law. And it was God's way of saying to Israel, I love you. And you know what? Three times in Exodus 19 and 20, Three times you'll find in those two chapters, they said, we do, we do, we do. They agreed to this love relationship that the Lord was bringing them into. And what they meant by that is, we do, we will obey, we will agree, we vow what you have written down in this contract. And then, of course, they didn't have a ring. We have rings for marriage. You read in Exodus chapter 30 that the sign of the covenant that God gave between himself and Israel to wed them was the Sabbath. So Shabbat became the sign, the wedding ring, if you will, that uh, Israel belonged to the Lord. That's, uh, I think, Exodus 31. So you say, okay, what does that have to do with us? What I see in that seventh verse of Exodus 6, in that fourth I, I, uh, that uh, fourth cup that I will take you to myself, it's God's marriage. It's him performing a ceremony with his people. I'm going to bring you, I'm going to wed you to myself. You're going to be my wife. I'm going to be your husband. Did you know that every New Covenant believer is promised a marriage with the Lord as well. Of course you knew that. In fact, think of it this way. The Christian life is a love affair. The Christian life is a love affair. It's, it's the bride, the church, loving the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, and him loving his bride. When Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure, he said, as the Jewish custom was. I, as a bridegroom, am going to go away, and I'm going to build a hoopah for you. But don't fear. I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you unto myself, and we'll be together forever. It's a love relationship. I remember what John said in his letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Do you? He said, you're a great church. You have a lot going for you. You're doing a lot right, but I have one thing against you. You remember what it was? He says, you have left your first love. And I think the first love is none other than the love that we have, that love relationship with the Lord Jesus. That's the first love. And I wonder if you need to reclaim your first love tonight. I wonder if 
You need to reclaim that love relationship that you are to have with the Lord. Do you remember how you felt, if you're a married man, that when you saw your bride walking down the aisle on your wedding day? As a husband, you know what it feels like when your wife pleases you? How do you think it must thrill God when he sees the beauty of a life that is set apart to him and is depending upon him to be faithful? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's a third hope from Passover that I get out of verse 8 that I'd like to end with. Not only the hope of deliverance, not only the hope of, of uh, marriage, but thirdly, look at what he says there. I'll bring you into a land, and I'll give it to you as a heritage, as an inheritance. That, I believe, is the hope of provision. God brought Israel out, Deuteronomy 6.23 says, so that he could bring them in. God brought about that exodus, that Passover night. He brought them out of Egyptian slavery and bondage. He redeemed them in order to bring them into this promised land that he talked about. You'll find that he says that uh, wherever, wherever your foot will touch, I'll give you that land. Provision. The promise of provision. You know what the promised land is equal to in the believing life that you and I are a part of? That promised land is the equivalent of stepping into and possessing the victorious life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an entrance into that land that is promised here as part of that provision, and there is an inheritance into that land, in that land as well. And the entrance into that land is you step into it. God's promise is, I'm going to give you this land, and you just need to move forward into it. You enter into it, and you enter into it based upon my promise to you. Well, you know what? It's no different. In a victorious Christian life, the entrance into it is simply by faith alone. It's by faith obedience. You simply believe, you depend upon the promise of the potential victory as you step forward in faith. And the Bible says that uh, just as death reigned through Adam, we reign through Christ in this life, Romans 5.17 tells us. And so there's an entrance that gets stepped into by faith. And when you do so, when you step by faith into that victorious life of Christ, you'll find a rich inheritance there. You know, Moses was told in Exodus chapter 3, I, for, by God, I heard your people's cry, and I've come down to deliver them, and I'm going to deliver them, and I'm going to take them into a land, I'll promise you, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Deuteronomy chapter 11, he tells them, you're going to go into a land and you're going to dwell in houses that you didn't build. You're going to, you're going to pick crops that you didn't plant. It's, it's going to be ready-made for you. God tells Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, he says, wherever your foot, wherever your foot steps, wherever the sole of your foot is planted, that's the, that I'm going to give you that land. And that's exactly what happened as you read the book of Joshua. You know, he promised them, look at that eighth verse, I will give it to you for an heritage. You know, a lot of times, often, we have to wait years before we get a promised inheritance. But our spiritual inheritance, here's the wonderful thing, is available immediately. It's available immediately. To any believer, the spiritual inheritance can be taken advantage of now. And not only a future enjoyment of a heavenly inheritance, but here, this life, the victorious life of Christ, it is a practical earthly provision that you can 
have now, immediately. It's the inheritance of, of the Lord Jesus' victorious life. It's possible by faith. It is Jesus' victorious life activated in you at the need of every moment as you depend on the Holy Spirit's power to completely counteract the power of sin in your life by the infusion of the powerful life of Christ in its place. Passover celebrates a loving relationship with God that he forms with his people and that fixes them and frees them from a very ugly slavery to fully embrace him and to enjoy him and all his abundant goodness in their lives. Well, the Christian life is liberating. The Christian life is liberating. It is not a freedom to sin, but a freedom not to sin. A freedom to experience the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. A holy life to experience the Lord's victory. You know, I thought about that. And uh, I thought, you know, maybe a good illustration of what it means to experience the victory of Jesus' life in your life is kind of like flying an airplane. You get in. And you take off with the knowledge and also an application of flight rules. And you, de you totally depend upon the laws of mechanics and aerodynamics to overcome gravity and to enable you to, to lift off and uh, to fly. And even while you're flying that plane, if you, you feel like maybe you're losing altitude or, or sometimes I've heard people Get, getting into a storm and, and can't see, and, and it feels like they're flying upside down. You, you have to trust your instruments. You have to trust what your instruments on the panel are showing you, and if you do so, you'll safely arrive. It's not how you might feel while you're flying. Well, let me tell you this. You may not be in a plane, but you're in Christ. You're in Christ, and Christ is in you. His Spirit is in you. And, uh, and uh, you begin your day with a knowledge, with a knowledge of the law of the Spirit and totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit to counteract sin's power in your life. And no matter how you feel, you trust Him. You depend upon Him. It doesn't matter how you feel. You trust Him and you, you take His grace. You take His deliverance his delivering power to empower you to overcome any temptation that comes your way at that moment. And that's what it means to experience the life of Christ, who is our Passover. Passover hope. It's a hope of provision. Spiritual provision. A life of holiness. A life of victory here and now. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a marriage. Passover hope is a marriage. It is the wedding of your human spirit to the spirit of Christ himself that makes you the bride of Christ. It is also the hope of deliverance, not only from sin's penalty, but also from sin's power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do ask that you might use these thoughts, these hopeful thoughts that emerge from the story of Passover, these I wills that God promises Israel that has application and impact upon all of us, use these hopes of deliverance, of marriage, and of provision mightily in our hearts. I pray that as a result, we would just praise you we would take that cup of praise and lift it in thanks and in glory and glorify you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.